Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Ring Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Happy New Year 2023 to you all. Today on the show, I have Nikki Wakeman, who's a healer with over 20 years experience, and she's helped thousands of people. And she is really tuned into the energy of love. So she helps to recharge your energy, the spark that helps to fill you up, and anything to do with abundance. So she's got a lot of experience in healing, different types of healing. She does reflexology, which, as you know, is the acupressure points in the feet. If you've never had reflexology, I would encourage you to try it. It's absolutely amazing. She's an energy healer. She helps to cleanse and clear and align your body but she also does this with spaces so she helps with house cleansing and she can help you remotely as well she's also a reiki healer she's an nlp practitioner and a life coach so she engages people with their heart center helping you find that natural unique flow within Nikki's a very spiritual person, which is why I was drawn to her. And she can help you to look at your past and move on to the future. So many times people are stuck in the events of the past because as we know, the past has moved on. The past is the past. But your mind can be stuck in those events of the past, which can stop you from moving forward. So when I hear people say, oh, you know, the past, people are in the past and the past can't affect you. I don't believe that's true. I believe the past does affect you. In fact, we've got lots of evidence of that in counseling. Things that have happened to people in the past in psychotherapy, these things come up. And this is why the past can affect you. Yes, we cannot go back to the past, but we can in our mind. And we do every day. For some people, it's all day. They're in the past about what happened. Nikki is also the owner of the retreat, uh, a retreat that she holds in Warwickshire. And it's a beautiful part of the country. If you've never been to Warwick, oh, the castle and everything, beautiful. And Nikki and I have so many things in common, one of them being Warwick. Um, and you can go there and experience mindfulness, relaxation, clearing, cleansing, lots of body realignment, beautiful energy work, which I do as well. But it's always interesting to speak to other people who do the same work. So welcome to the show, Nikki Wakeman. Nikki, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to have you here. Thanks, Sean. Um, Thanks for having me. Lovely to be here. Great. So, you know, you've got an interesting background, but I want to talk about what you're doing now. Because you do healing, and I would have said in the intro about all the retreats you do, I'd be interested to know what got you on the path to knowing? How did you find out that you could actually help people through all of these modalities, reflexology, healing, energy healing, Reiki, all of that? How did that come about? It came about, um, the real backstory is at five years old, a lady, I I lost, I found some money on a beach uh, in Cornwall and a lady came up to me and said, you have the gift, my dear. And I went, what? I'm five. No idea what you're talking about. And she looked at my hands and she said, you have this line. um, Not many people have it. You will be able to read people all your life and you'll be able to help people all your life. And that will be your gift. And what a lovely gift to have. And she said, hold on to this five pounds um, and it will be your lucky five pounds. And she just went on her way. And that's stayed with me. And when I look back, um, that's what I, I laugh because I think how funny, even at that age. And I kind of fought it. So again, about 16 um, I think my parents got divorced and my mum was going to all these readers because she just wanted some some like help. Um, and everyone, I, and I'd go with my mum, go, mm, and everyone would go, what are you doing here? You could do this for her. Um, so uh, then this is one of my nearly 50. So this is like 70s, 80s. And it's not, it's very woo. It's very, you're very much Mystic Meg, aren't you? With a crystal ball and you're doing all this. 
And so I kind of poo-pooed it for a long time. And then I, um, you know, carried on, went to university, did drama at university. So I got a drama degree and then went into television and film. And it was amazing. I did exactly what I wanted to do. And then I thought, this is awful because it's really stressful. Um, it was the 90s. So it was kind of drug fueled and rock and roll and all this kind of stuff. And everyone's like, yeah, but no one's really filling their soul. And I thought, I can't do any of this for long. I mean, it's really good. And when you realize that um, you have have reached the pinnacle of what you thought you wanted to do, which is to work in TV. And then you realize it's, this is just a fraud. And I don't mean that for all those people who work in TV, it's very hard um, and good on them, because especially women who have gone through it. It's a very man's world um, and it's very difficult and it, it takes a lot of balls. Um, so, you know, amazing if you've carried on um, and you're not broken. Um, and so I decided to come out of it slightly broken um, with probably a few addictions that were going on running alongside just to keep me um, alive in some ways. And then the last job I had, I worked for Andrew Lloyd Webber and we did um, Cats, um, the musical and um, other, I think Oklahoma. And there was women on set. There was some sort of, because it was a more holistic, if you like, environment and there was a dance environment, people had uh, therapists on set so they had done um mass masses that kind of thing on set and this woman just worked with all these people healing them i mean on whatever level and she was this beautiful woman and i thought what a great job what a great job because she and i loved the fact that she was able to be intimate with people have one-to-ones with people it wasn't maybe i craved less of the group setting um and so I, I just, it stayed with me. I ended up finished. That was kind of the last few jobs I did. And then I, I stopped and went traveling. And of course you go traveling, you meet loads of other people. But just before I went traveling, I went out with this guy and his mother came up to me and said, I really want to do Reiki on you. And I'm being told by my guides that I need to teach you how to do Reiki. And I was like, okay, well, then I'll do that then. So she taught me Reiki one. I obviously when then went traveling and learned a lot more, did a lot of kind of more, um, out there are quite a lot of Eastern modalities in Australia, strangely. Um, and then lots of things happened there. And then I came home and then I asked this lady again to do Reiki 2 on me, even though I was no longer with her son and did that. And that kind of got me going. I then thought I can't just live on Reiki alone. I need to um, have something, I think because of the background I have and the fact that it, everything was a bit woo, I then thought I need to do something serious. Like I did massage, reflexology. I worked for big spas. I worked for Champness to start with. And I was their specialist healer there, which was done. I still did some massage and did other things, but people would come especially to do Reiki. Mm. Um, and then I um, worked, I was uh, poached by a company in London to teach um, various modalities, so it'd be like Thai massage, um, lymphatic drainage, so physical as well as spiritual. And I think I went much more on on the um, physical at that point because it was easier um, to sell and felt, felt more comfortable with it. So I put it to the back of my mind, but then I got older and I was able to expand my energies more and people would come to, to me every time I did a treatment, I would be able to see insights that I thought everyone could see. It would just be normal. I'd be like, oh yeah, so-and-so's coming through or or I can feel what's going on with your stomach and all this kind of stuff. And um, I actually for a long time, just took that as normal. But my practice grew and grew and grew to a point where I, I couldn't maintain the practice doing just massage or reflexology or whatever, because it'd be too tiring. So then I'm, and I was at that point working at Neil Shard Remedies in Leamington Spa, which is lovely. Um, I worked there for 10 years and um, I really enjoyed that there, but I realized I needed to be able to expand beyond a clinic. So I actually looked after my mother who had motor neuron for two years and we built her a cabin in my garden. And so we looked after her and when she died, um, which is kind of a blessing because motor neuron is a horrible, horrible disease. Um, I had her cabin and that's what she wants. She goes, are you going to use this cabin? Are you going to, you know, are you going to be able to do treatments from there? Are you going to, I was like, yeah, mum, it'll be amazing. Thank you so much. So that was her legacy to me, um, was this beautiful cabin, um, which I then started treating out of. Um, and 
then I was able to really get involved with my spiritual side and people would come and I had the space to expand it. Um, and I've been, I've had the cabin now for seven years and I have a therapy room in my house as well. So I thought, well, the retreats, the, the cabin's huge for like a little therapy room. You don't need it. And it's got a wet room and it was all set up for my mum, and it's got easy access. So people could come in wheelchairs. Um, and so I built in one of my dreams as a child was to have one of those um, wall beds that come down. Like it's very sci-fi and when I was young. Um, and so um, I built one of those and some wardrobes. So it was still a clinic room, but people could come and um, they could do yoga in it or they could just put the bed down and, but as it happens, the bed is down now. It is purely a retreat. So people just come. They can have a one night or a two night stay and they can just have the treatments up there, whatever it may be, and then fall into bed because that's kind of what you want to do after a treatment. So um, I can do physical stuff, obviously. And I all and it kind of what everybody every time people come, it's a bespoke scenario. People bring what they bring on the day. So my last client, who the person who came and stayed in the retreat, um, we did some physical, some spiritual, some emotional, actually, and some card readings and some um, energy healing. And actually, you know, a little bit of astrology as well. We did quite a few little bits that all linked together. Because when you have, as you know, Shah, as you, when you have lots of different things, Sometimes you, it's just great to have that little toolbox of different things that you can add in. Sometimes people want the full gambit. They want, I want a reading, I want this, and that's great. But there's so many parts of us that need healing and that link together. We're not separate. So it's so nice to be able to use all these skills. So in the retreat, I'm able to use them all, have, give people more space, and then they can sit and relax and I live in the middle of Warwick, which is, so I've got the castle one side, the race course the other side, um, and the town, like a five minute walk. So you're kind of secluded, but in the middle of it all. So you can go out for dinner. You can, I mean, I was, the last person who came was um, just a, a lady on her own, which is great, but you can bring a friend. And it's a nice experience to have. It's, it's almost, I think, like the new going out, <laughs> having a retreat with your friend, being able to experience that with each other and you have you can have treatments together or separately of course um and also because of the race course we can have a little walk um we can do walking meditation um depending on the weather not so much this time of year but if you want to bring your boots you can um so that's kind of what i'm doing as well alongside having my treatments in my treatment room and um I've got some days coming up teaching Reiki for all those people interested, like Reiki 1 and Reiki 2. And also I'm doing a quantum healing day, which is really, it's real self-care. So it's welcome to everybody, but it's really teaching yourself how to be your own best friend, giving yourselves the things that you give your best friends, you know, giving them the support, the back, you got your back, being kind to you, really reteaching re ourselves how we, are kind to ourselves we teach especially as women we're told to be so kind to everybody oh my god let's be kind to ourselves let's completely like remember all these things that we give out that we need to harness on ourselves and we forget and then we feel guilty if we are so it's really being able to go into different parts of our body really feel our bodies our hearts our guts our gut instincts our heart energy our throat energy to be able to express it our whole connection with our higher self, really just incorporating all of that to be able to um, be fully in our power, fully with ourselves, fully understanding ourselves, because we're interesting, complex, fascinating creatures that we are still learning about. We didn't get a little book when we were born. We got like, we're still learning. And so we're all writing our books, you know, like, or, and we can write it however we want. And we are the protagonist in our own story. And we want to be able to have an exciting, loved filled, joyous, deep meaningful experience and not always that's nice but it's always part of the journey and it's somehow in this day and age when we're not supposed to be sad we're not supposed to be anxious it's been or we are anxious or we are sad it's like it's a it's a flow of emotions that goes through us all the time we don't pick them up and keep them we we just let them flow through us and that I feel is so important and really important for me really important of my journey just to know that we are free 
we are but we are our own creatures it's not our external life it's our internal invisible selves that we are journeying with and we can share that with other people and at least share it with our non-visible selves because sometimes we're hiding that so we need to just bring it to our conscious mind that we are these wonderful creatures and talk to ourselves like we are wonderful creatures so that's what I'm trying to do (laughs) excellent Nikki, there's so much in that. And and I have to say, as you speak, your words are healing. It's something in your voice that's healing. I'm sure my listeners would agree. And there's something about your energy that is very healing. So I can see why all those years ago, well, it wasn't that. You, you, you're not even 50 yet. But anyway, when those, those years ago, when... So- <laughs> When somebody said to you, you know what, you've got the gift, I can see why. But also the parallels. Interestingly interestingly enough, I rented space at Neil's Yard Remedies in Clapham for 13 years. So amazing. So Neil's Yard, we have in common. When you said that, I thought, wow. (laughs) That is such a sacred healing space as well, Neil Jard. Um, the therapy, now, not all the stores have therapy rooms, but the ones that do, it's very healing. The Covent Garden store, lots of traffic through there. Also, what you talk about, the aspect of healing and how you offer different modalities. So I could imagine people come to you and, as you say, they want it all. So when we look at that, I'm going to come back to your retreats in a minute. When you talked about the entertainment business, TV, which I've done a lot of TV, I was an extra in LA on movie sets and all that stuff, you know, the parallels are incredible here. And Los Angeles, LA at the time was just, well, it still is a bit of a mishmash of everything and everyone. But I would hear directors shout at people and demean them and all, and people just didn't feel they could speak up or anything. So, but it was interesting to watch all in LA, you know. However, the reason I bring that up, creativity. I want to ask you about your thoughts on creativity. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Are people born with, because you you wanted to be in that industry for a reason. So are we born, do you think, with some type of creativity or is it something we learn? Uh, No, I really think we are born with with creativity. And I think it can be suppressed by parental control or societal societal control, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, And I think we all do because people think that science isn't creative. (laughs) <laughs> like what <laughs> like of course it is creative thought that's what we're talking about creative thought not that you can draw or that you can write music or whatever it is it's not that that's not creativity anyone can learn french if they tried hard enough anyone can learn an instrument if they tried hard enough and it's not that it's about creative thought and thinking for yourself outside the box um thinking new thoughts not so as I'm sure you know, um, neurological pathways are made. So if you keep going down the same neurological pathway, no difference will ever happen. If you keep opening the same front door, you keep thinking the same thoughts. A lot of the time we are thinking the same thoughts. And sometimes I go, I am boring myself with my own thoughts and just to have different thoughts. And creativity is about that. So even if it's like watching, what did I, I went ice skating last night for the first time since I was about 25, with my two children, and um, we all had a scream. They'd never been before, and it was really, really, really hard. We all cried. We all fell over. We all did, but we carried on for two and a half hours <laughs> with a 15-minute break. And I was watching them and thought, they are learning so much. One of mine is so determined She's rubbish at it. Well, she should be. She's only just got on it on the the thing. She's so risk taking. She's on the floor hundreds of times, you know, just gets up, cries a bit and then just gets up again. And I'm my, my the mother in me is going, oh, take her home. I don't like it. And then the other part of me is like, no, just she's brilliant. She's so determined. The other one is practicing little pirouettes, but she's using one of those penguins. She's getting it all sorted, but having as much support as she can. And the other one's just flinging herself. And you just watch them and think, their neurological pathways are 
just exploding because they are physically, mentally, emotionally as wired in this moment that they can because they're just learning new things. And it was an amazing supportive ice rink, went to Solihull Ice Rink and there was loads of young people supporting. They were, every time you fell over, they were there. Are you all right? Do you want me to pick you up? And you were like, wow, some, all these really lovely young folk and lots of people really, like just normal people just going, you're right when every time you fell over because it's hard, the ice and everyone knows and everyone was very, it was a very community experience. But it, that's just illustrates that, that creativity is not about learning. It's about experiencing and letting yourself experience that moment without fear. Um, because fear blocks our experience because then we internalize, we get frightened and it almost freezes our whole brain to not do it. So if you can just go, yes, this might hurt when I fall over, but just get up again or just try something new. I fell over that way that time, I'm gonna try something new. And if you can keep doing that throughout your life and there's those old expressions, you know, um, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And it's really true. I love a cliche because they're all true, but it's, you know, it's boring, but true. And it, you know, you want to just keep trying new things. And if you don't see new things and experience new things, where do you get this new influx of information from? You can't, we're, on, we're, we're, we're only animals. We do need external things, not to rely on them. That's the balance to give us our nurture it has to be both ways. It's a symbiotic relationship with our, our environment and our soul. Um, yes, good way to put it, absolutely. Uh, as you were speaking, it reminded me of something else. Uh, one of my best friends lives in Warwick and I was just there. No, I, I know, it's great, I'm just there. She just texted me the other day saying, you need to come back up. So when you talked about the castle, I was just walking. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always <laughs> back and forth. We're we're always back and forth to war. Beautiful, beautiful town. Uh, <laughs> the parallels keep coming. Um, but yes, so creativity, good thoughts around that. Because I think people get lost a little bit. They think that they're not creative, but when you look at their lives, they find ways to do things, and that's creativity. When you look at healing and why people may come to you. What are some of the reasons that people present? It's a very good question. There is usually a blockage. So it is a transformation from one state of being to another that people are looking for, even though they don't know that. Um, but it is, say, for example, a good example, um, um, not being able to get pregnant. Mm. So, the, but they have already had a baby then they're all, they've gone through all the medical intervention and you know, they're, they're good. And then they come to me and um, then they get pregnant. I can't say that that's me because obviously that is their body doing what their body needs to do or not the healing, but the healing always takes, lets your body be in flow. And, um, the body does know how to have a baby, for example. So it, just putting it in flow is, is how that works. Um, other things, anxiety a lot at the moment to people, for people to be able to understand their anxiety and for me to talk them through the fact that it's not that they are anxious. It is um, a part of them that is anxious, that is, they are stopping it flow, flowing. They are, um, trying to think of a good way of putting that, they are almost anxious about being anxious. So they're like, oh, if I do this, this might happen. Yes, it might, but you won't die. You won't, um, you know, nothing terrible will happen. You might make a mistake or you might not. And until you do, but the prop, you know, you won't know. And that is also an makes you anxious because not doing something also makes you anxious. So there's just that step, sort of hand holding that step of people, of letting people feel strong enough or complete enough to know that even if it doesn't work out, it's fine. And if it does work out, it's great. So it's, yeah, anxiety is massive, isn't it at the moment? It's just massive because of the pandemic because everyone's not gone out, because everybody's forgotten how big the world is. They don't know how to cope with it. Or they've really enjoyed their insular time, which is also fine. You know, we don't, life's very big and the internet makes life very big. And you can find ways of 
um, making it manageable. I think that's it. It's managing. That's what it is. It's managing ourselves, isn't it? Uh, me managing myself, you managing yourself, all just managing ourselves. So it's when we feel out of control in some way. So um, that's why people see me really, even if it's um, work related, they're just stressed. People are just stressed and just trying to find a way through not feeling adrenal all the time, which makes you, and I mean by that, that they're, their bodies are actually manifesting stress and they can't get out of fight and flight, which makes your body ill because you just can't turn off. You can't relax. You're always on that treadmill. We're, we're going and we are in this crazy world that's making us work and sleep and have children and look after them and then do some more work and then wash up and clean the house and did it. You know, it's a really and that is also what is the anxiety. The yes. fact that your cortisol is turned on and then you can't get away from it. So it's it's letting people know that it's OK to turn it off because it's also on full alert all the time, which means you're ready for anything. You're like, oh. but that actually is terrible to be like that all the time because we're cavemen. You know, we are like fight, flight or sleep. And we, we, we now don't know the difference from being chased by a bear or somebody being mean to us at work. It's all the same for our bodies. And actually, we just need to know that a bear isn't chasing us and that person is, is mean at work, it, it's fine. You have to be able to shut that out because you need to send to yourself and it's okay to be you and to send to yourself and be healed by you because we all can heal ourselves. Absolutely. Oh, such a good point about healing yourself because a lot of people do come to us for healing and yes, we can help to facilitate it, but you do have to show up as well. You have to be open to the healing. Um, yes and a part of the healing is taking responsibility for yourself and I don't mean that in a boring way I mean it in a lovely way like getting to know yourself and knowing if I step into a road I may get hit by a car if I don't if I walk on the site and on the on the pavement that's up you know I won't it's kind of doing letting people know that starting fights with your friends or you know it's it's how to manage we all are anxious, we are all angry, we all have the same amount of emotions of each other, it's just how to manage them. And I don't think we're taught that as kids. I mean, I certainly wasn't. And I've had to, uh, I mean, really my 20s and my 30s were about that. And I'm not saying I'm really good at it now either, <laughs> but I'm better at taking that breath before you let it out. Taking that moment to think, what, what am I, okay, I'm feeling this. Why am I feeling this? Am I, and it's usually because I feel out of control and misunderstood. Mm. That's my bottom line. Yes. And everyone has different bottom lines. Absolute. Good point. It's the threat. So feeling out of control. And that is the start of the stress, you know. And I always say to people, try, try and leverage the threat, you know. Like you mentioned, the, the idea of the big bear. You know, is someone confronting you about something? That's not really a big bear, but is it? Because you can always walk away. Um, and nobody's died from a panic attack. Um, we've got no evidence of that. You can recover from all of these issues. So that's such a good point. Um, it reminds me of that quote, though, when you talk about being kinder to yourself, that no one has ever healed themselves by wounding somebody else. No, very good point. And it is, we need to all, if we take, like you said, responsibility for our own actions, but also when we're sad and go, actually, I feel really sad today. I'm going to eat ice cream and watch PS I Love You or whatever film. I don't know why that film came to mind, but whatever soppy film you want to watch. I felt sad yesterday and watch Love Actually. Yay. it was great I cried I laughed I know all of it but it was still beautiful and it's being able to know that today maybe not go and I don't know do something that's against what you're feeling just really hone in again onto yourself and think what do I need to nourish myself and we live again in this really busy world and that we should be busy because then you're just but you're distracting yourself from what you really need to do to nourish yourself in that day, even if it's like an hour, you know, it doesn't have to be a day. Um, and so it is learning that it's okay to look after yourself, learning that all of your emotions are emotions that we all share and we don't have them all at the same time, but we all have them. And if people are not understanding of your emotions, then don't 
don't ask them for help. Yes, people do go to the wrong people for help. They want people, they expect a lot from other people when they cannot deliver. They haven't got the capacity, nor the knowledge, nor the fortitude, or the empathy sometimes yeah. to listen. Yeah. But yes, some people, we all have different capacities for different things. And I believe we'll link up somehow. We we all link up. Some yeah. people will spike our neurotransmitters. Uh, they'll be firing off all the time and you'll feel drained. When you come away, you'll slither away and think, oh, I need protection. I need safety. I need to rest. Energy is so important. And we I don't believe we're all aware of how much we connect. For me, water is cleansing. What elements are helpful for you? Water, fire, air, all of them. So the one that comes to me, is, as you said, that is air. So I feel very drawn to going on a walk on a windy day um, or the seaside because I'm probably the most landlocked place, as you know, in the country. <laughs> so I crave that because I do feel quite um, polluted here. There's a lot of um, actual just cars and mm. That sort of um, really drawn to fire, but I am fire. There's there's a part of me that is the fire. So I, it has to be very cold and very wintry for me to want to have a fire. And my youngest daughter is very petrified of fire at the minute. We we haven't got open fires. We've got the we've got an old house, but we haven't got them going because I think I I don't need fire as much unless I'm outside. Outside fire good. Inside not so much. Um, water very much. So I. I have to have a bath. Yeah. Like I have to have a bath. I'm like, I'm like with the heating prices going up and everything, I'm like, mm. um, but I have to have a bath and I put salts in the bath and I soak in the bath and I would do it every day. Um, but I would, that would be my thing. And it feels fully cleansing um, for me to be actually suspended in water. And I would also swim. I would sw I swim twice a week. So um, yeah, those being in water is incredibly important. Um, but I'm not a, a you know, a, a freshwater swimmer. I know it's all the thing, but I want to be warm. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and an earth, I feel very connected to earth and mother earth constantly, like I do fire, actually. It's very much I'm probably just dust, fire and dirt. <laughs> but um I feel very connected to both of those all the time like innately um I feel the earth beneath my feet all the time I wear bare feet all the time I um even in this cold um but I, I really enjoy being connected to where we stand how we sit what we feel um what we manifest what we've got around us Amazing. Even as you're speaking now, yes, I'm imagining grounding myself. I'm an air sign. So for me, earth is important as well. So the forest walks and things like that, very important. I definitely take a walk. I'm in London. I'm in the city, but I get out and take a walk every day. Yes, it's concrete. There are some trees, lots of trees around where I am. But yes, for me, air, earth very very important when we look at life purpose because i just did a, a a podcast on that it's out on christmas eve normally i publish everything on a sunday but because christmas is on a sunday this year it's out on christmas eve by the time you guys see this it will have been out talked about purpose what are your thoughts about our purpose in life or purpose says because i believe we're here for different reasons and sometimes they'll be threefold tenfold we'll accomplish a lot in this lifetime what are your thoughts around life <clears throat> it's a really good question um i think in one way if we don't find some sort of life purpose we feel very lost mm. but saying that i wouldn't want to put the pressure on people to find one because they think it's external of themselves. Like I've got to be really good at gym or I've got to really be really good at, I don't know, being an electrician or I've got to be really good at something. 
you don't have to be really good at any of them. They're innate things that come easily. And if you try to find them, which is the annoying bit, it's your kind. Of, you, it's almost elu- eluding you all the time. So hence back to space and breath and not trying so hard, which does go against our society at the minute. Because uh, we're told to try very hard. Um, but I do think we do have a sole purpose. And actually, my one of my treatments, in fact all of my treatments are called soul purpose, whether it would be physical or spiritual soul purpose, because I believe that all of the treatments lead you to either finding it or reestablishing it or constantly being connected to it. Because I do believe we do have a soul purpose because every single one of us are connected. And if we both, we both, we both, and everyone else in the whole world um, finds their purpose, this little tiny nugget of the in, in gene, everyone has their genius, mm. then we would all be evolving continually into amazing, because we would all come together with all our differences and it would make up this beautiful structure of us all being able to understand parts of each other that are new to us because we're all giving our true nature, which is our true purpose. But it's being able to really get through all the crap to get to our true nature. And that is our purpose. So it's nothing more than that. But it's being able to find it and being, letting it establish and letting it out, letting it be free, letting it actually just come out of you and go, I can breathe. And that's what I think our purpose is. Excellent way to look at it. I think a lot of people look at purpose as it being something huge and big because of social media and everything. People think, that, you know, celebrity is a life purpose. I know. And often people have said to me, especially when I'm doing mediumship readings, you know, I feel like I'm here to save the world. I feel like I'm here to do something huge or big. Okay, well, if that's the case, maybe let's see what spirits say. But huge or big for you could be you're here to mother two children or you're here to, to adopt a child or you're here to father a son, or you're here to care for the elderly. That's big as well. Celebrity isn't everything, but I think it's our world. It, and- unfortunately, it is. But I think we're seeing it. It's, it's so new. I mean, it, if you really want to do celebrity back to like the silver screens, it's like 60 years ago, isn't it really? And then that's how it's evolved. And is there, do you think there's like, I think there's a 75 year old year, year cycle? Yes, so we're sort of coming to the end of that uh, it a bit, which which may only mean that we'll completely be here still, but people will know what it means. They won't aspire to be Joey Essex, or um, you know, it, people just for being famous for being them, which in a way is quite amazing. It is. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Yes, and you're right about that. That's so seventy five because it was dying out. The the real celebrity, the Elizabeth Taylors, the Richard Burtons. That had all died out. And then we had the internet celebrity, the Instagram celebrity. And now that's diluted. Everybody can be a star in their own right. So I don't think we'll ever reach the Freddie Mercury's uh, level yeah. of this world again. Yeah. Maybe not all the Beatles or things it's like that. Things. It's just a different, yeah, it's a different time. But maybe that's it. Maybe you've hit the nail on the head. The fact that everybody can now be a celebrity. Then if we all have our little bit of genius then maybe that's how we platform it. If everybody can do their little tiny bit and be honest and truly them without wanting to be moneyed or wanting or more, I don't know, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, this is coming straight out my head. But if everybody could show their bit of genius, then we would all be happy sharing it. But obviously not everybody wants to be on telly, but if but have being a good neighbour or being caring or... Um, Yes. If we could all be encouraged to just be ourselves and maybe we could use social media as that. So people do post when they're sad. People do post when they're anxious. People do post when they're angry. Anger and shame never get talked about. They're like right low down here. Nobody's allowed to be angry. That's like, oh, nobody's allowed to mention shame. But it's like if people could actually share these things, not on social media, obviously. It, I mean, if you can, amazing. But with each other then we would be sharing again all the emotions and then we would be able to not be ashamed to be truly ourselves because I think it's the shame that keeps people being locked away 
Absolutely right. Yes. And people have seen anger as negative. You know, there's this toxic positivity out there. You're angry. That's negative. You know, so that pushes you away from getting in touch with your true emotions. Anger is just another emotion. Sometimes it can be misdirected. And therefore, we have to examine that. But yes, anger is not negative. But everything is love and light. Be positive. It's all taken out of context. Love and light. Love humanity. Harm none. (laughs) I I, I know them. I've said them. But, uh, you know, and I do too. And, you know, it's great that there, there are people out there just saying it's all really great. But it's not it feels very untangible um, and it's all very well to be this white energy and it's all really amazing. But, you know, it's like monks want, you know, they're on the, they're on the hill making beer, having a great time, but they're not actually being dads or going to work or having to actually integrate with anyone. They're just silent. Yeah. And that's um, the point, the monks, I do want to make. Absolutely. I've often referred to that when people say, well, how can I find that Zen? And I don't be a monk. Monks have to leave, leave regular life to try and work on that. You don't have to join a monastery. You can sort of take steps, meditate a few minutes a day. But it's the idea that we must be Zen 24 hours a day. And that's unrealistic unless you join a monastery and can separate yourself from the real world because that is a separation. And you don't have external factors coming in. You don't have people pushing you on the tube or children shouting in your ear or dogs jumping on your back yeah i'm with you yeah it is it's all very well and it's and it's great if you want to be a monk but that's what you give up you give up being part of the world and you you give up or none um and you go and become an academic in your field and that's fine and that's the choice but you can't criticize people for not being zen all the time when they're living this very fast life it's too fast and it's it's very hard it's very have bad days if you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiverin.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. Did you, now we talked about your your career now. Have you done anything else besides the, you know, were you ever in a, like I call it, a job job? Um, I So I went to uni, came out, went straight into doing uh, television and film. And then I, when I decided it was all too much, decided to come, I went traveling for a year. Um, I came home to save money. Very hard in London to save money. In the oh. 20s. Um, and so I came home and got a job at my local newspaper selling advertising space. And I did that for two years on and off. And I all and when I worked in television a bit, if I wasn't working, I would go and work in a bar mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So I've had odd jobs. But since I was 28, I've done what I've done. And I'm now 48, 49 in a couple of weeks. But where did that, interestingly enough, you mentioned that, how did that, when we talk about purpose, how did those jobs play in to your life? Because a lot of people get confused about that. What no, that not all. I, I loved, I love working in a bar. There's something very glorious about, I think it, for my children, I'd say, just go and work in a bar or be a waitress um, because it's very grounding. You get really good at maths if you have to work in a bar with Maybe not anymore because it's digital. No, I bet they do. So you have to work it out in the head. Um, you get people shouting at you, being mean to you. You are on your feet for like 12 hour sessions. Um, you are also part of a family when you work in a bar or a pub, um, which you will have after hours drinks. You all this stuff. It's a kind of um, you have it. You know, you have the boss um, that. But you're all there as a team having fun and in a fun environment. And it's really good fun. Um so I, re- I really enjoyed that. But there is that point that's like, what do I do now? And I think it is bar jobs, unless that's your career. And some people make bloody good careers out of being of being uh, running bars and owning bars. And that can be their purpose, definitely. Um, the other jobs, um, working in, working in um, advertising, it's sales. And I think everybody should do a bit of a sales job because to do anything in this world you have to sell yourself to a point 
And it doesn't mean, hi, I'm Nikki. No, no, no. It's just, you have to be able to look people in the eye and say, hello, I'm here to do this. If you don't like it, you can tell me to go away. You can, um, if you could hear me out for five minutes, however way that your sales pitch works to take rejection and not take it personally, to know that the other person can be having a really bad day and just doesn't want to talk to you right now. Um, to say, I can come back at another time, being kind to other people, being compassionate and being polite, um, I think go a long way. And speaking clearly so people understand what you're saying. Um, but of course, nerves get the better of people in doing that. Eye contact seems to be a diff more and more going downhill, I think, um, in the world. I'm not quite sure why. We need to look each other in the eye. We need to, you know, know that I know you, you know me. I know where we're coming from. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. If you don't want it to be, you know, it's fine. It's fine. Don't be scared of that. And the more you do it, the less scared you become. Because when you first go out there and you're selling something, you're like, ooh. Um, even if it's on the phone, I think people have phone jobs. It's still a really good skill. I think so. it's a really good skill. Um, working in television is an amazing uh, experience because you go from being, you know, making the tea to knowing how to make a sandwich. If you can't make a sandwich properly, you get fired because you can't understand instruction or how someone like so they'll say, you know, egg mayo, no cress on brown. They tell you who wants. If you can't take that information in and go and get a sandwich and bring it back, then you're fired. Because that, I mean, it's that level of, you have to be able to um, take the menial jobs and do them well. And I, I, I think that's really important. Listening, understanding, um, and, um, and being able to execute things and not going, I'm, too, I'm a bit too good for that. You know, I think I'm, I shouldn't be making sandwiches. I shouldn't be, you know, or, or make, uh, do, you know, ordering sandwiches. So that's what those things have taught me. That might be quite all, all old fashioned now. I'm not sure. Um, but I do think just being able to do what you're asked yeah. in whatever capacity um, is really important. Absolutely. You might have to do it again, but at the beginning, you know, that's what I've learned. Very good point. Uh, I have mentioned this before in another podcast, but a junior doctor recently told me that she was leaving the profession, you know, FY1, so first year doctor, uh, because she felt that people disrespected her and spoke to her in a disrespectful way. You know, well, I had thoughts on that because you're in a public se the public sector. That's going to happen, especially in your role as a doctor. So perhaps you are in the wrong profession. And my thoughts were, yes, get out before you hurt someone. Yeah, and it is. It's those things you've got to, and it's really wise of her. Yes, definitely. Because it is, if there's a line that you don't want to do, don't do it. Absolutely. Learn that straight early on. Absolutely. Like, I wouldn't want to be um, a lighting engineer. I would kill someone. I would electrocute them and kill them. I'm not detail orientated. I'm, you know, all this stuff. You learning these things about yourself, so you, so you go into the right profession. Absolutely, you know your limits. You know what you can do. Nikki, let's talk about daily practice for a moment. Uh, for our listeners out there, are there things that you do? I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly share. For me, I like to pray. I do meditation. I do yoga. I take a walk every day. Those things keep me sane. I, I'm going to use that word. Yeah, quite rightly. Yeah. And now those instances where I feel like I'm being pushed just don't occur because my body chemistry has changed. My mind chemistry has changed. And what used to have an impact no longer has. So I found those ways to help to change my mind and body and soul chemistry. What things do you do? What practices, daily practices help you? I swim twice or three times a week. I would do it more if I could, um, but that's, so that's purely just time. And there's something for me about switching off, as I said earlier, and being in water, immersed in water. <clears throat> but I, I can't say that as a daily practice because it, it's a bit, it's a, a step up. I get up earlier than everyone else in the house. Mm. So my body clock now, because I've done this for so long, wakes up at 10 to 7. 
at any time of year and I have a drink before anybody else gets up and I don't get anybody else up and I have a hot drink um which is like a it's like a mushroomy thing that's got brilliant mushrooms in it um and which is chocolate flavored so I feel like I'm having a treat and it's still yummy but it's it doesn't influence my cortisol so it's not coffee or tea and I need something hot in the in the morning and I think to myself about my day and I just think how I feel do I feel good today bad today how's that going what can I do to make myself and I feel better or feel worse or feel whatever it is um not feel worse but I just watch myself yeah and just so I don't meditate as such I just um well I do meditate because I meditate on what I am today and what my day has to hold and if I don't do that I have a rubbish day and if I skip one or two it still makes a difference I I need to just um yeah have that time alone because I'm in the midst of you know it's seven and eight year olds and um so it's very busy and I don't get to get it at night I'm too I've realized I'm too tired it, I'm, it's nine o'clock I'm I'm in bed if I could be um but maybe not always but it means that sometimes I don't get an evening to do the relaxing so I like to get go to bed early I do do yoga um and I do breathing exercises um and I do that when I have the drink and how did you learn though that these things helped you is it something you tried or did a friend say oh try this no I think I went with my instincts I started realizing I woke up early I stopped drinking alcohol about a year or two ago and that was my big change I still do drink a little but it's a little now um Christmas time I'm drinking more I'm thinking oh it, it's it's a very um alcohol's a strange fish but um so when I stopped drinking alcohol completely I realized I went my body clock went into a correct time zone and I've kept it there so I very much went on a meditative journey when I gave up alcohol um just to see the difference it was almost like an experiment on myself of how do, I knew it was making a difference and I couldn't work out how, so I thought I'll just cut it out completely and see what happened. And so my body went into the right clock. I then w asked it what it wanted to eat, what it wanted to drink, what time it wanted to wake up. So I kind of took the pressure off my brain and just went into my body and said, please guide me. And so it did. And I just instinctively let it. And it didn't, it, it literally did just, like my physical body would go towards the kettle. My physical body would go, I'd really want to be in water, so go for a swim today. I physically, it would be able to actually tell me these things in a bodily way. So I had to tune into that. So tune into what my body wanted. And I would do that through closing my eyes, meditating, asking what it wanted. Um, and right at the beginning when I was unsure and still when I'm unsure about new things, I will do a bit of muscle testing to see even just standing up and say, I am Nikki. I will, my body will naturally move forward. If I'm Fred, I'll, my body will do something different just to check the yes and no answers if I'm doubting myself. But as I've got older and especially with this experiment, I have learned to doubt myself less. Mm -hmm. um, but of course I'm not always right. And there may be external factors that, make me really doubt myself, especially in relationships and all that kind of stuff because there's other people involved and I would never, so I'm trying to be more, it, when you're incorporating other people, it's more difficult. But so my daily practice would be to go inside myself and check what it needs. Excellent. I'm glad you mentioned kinesiology because I think that's gone by the wayside a bit. Um, I agree. I just don't hear about it anymore. So I think it's because it's not, it's somebody else is doing it on you, which is the traditional thing. So I've heard kinesiology and some people do pull harder at right. certain things. And, and so it's difficult to monitor, but doing it on yourself, you're not pulling harder. It's a very easy thing to do. And if you are I get a lot of clients who are um, doubting their own gut instinct or doubting, you know, what's the right thing to do. And I say, stand up, say your name. You'll either lean backwards or forwards. Whichever one is the one when you say your name is your yes. 
yeah. and then another name and you'll move the other way and then you get that flow and you start going oh and it's then you can say do I need do I need to go to the you know park today or do I you know do I want that dress it can be ridiculously silly things or light things because it's still tuning your mind and your body to know what yes and right is for you yes. and it's fun to kind of see the responses as well um about 20 years ago so early 2000s that's when I started getting into kinesiology, yoga, and all that. And yes, I did all the in. I went to India. I, you don't have to go to India, but at the time, that's what we were all doing. We're going to Spain to these retreats. We're going yeah. to, to these retreats. We're going to Greece to those retreats. We're going to Spain. It was wow. all, yeah, but it, I have to say because it connected the mind, the body, and then the spirit. That's how I learned to get into the flow, that vinyasa. That's how I learned to get. Sometimes it's not just about the downward dog. But one thing I did learn, I don't care how many downward dogs you do, if you don't deal with the thoughts up here, those downward dogs, all that stuff means nothing. <laughs> so I just want to say that for listeners. You're, you're watching Instagram. You're seeing these beautiful poses. But you have got to do other work as well and how you described your journey into being guided so sort of you feeling pulled toward things i would invite our listeners to start to be open to that as well you'll be guided to what um, but i like going high heights as well so snowdonia places like i love hiking up to the highest highest point highest hike for me looking down that's beautiful um i want to ask you lastly is there a book in you, Nikki? I think there is. Um, on the other side of all of this, I have a very interesting family. So I do have, I feel like I have the journey that I've been on and then I have the backstory of that, which could make it more interesting. <laughs> um, and one of my friends, yeah, yes, I, I yes, not yet. Mm -hmm. I would, I'm going to say two years. But yes, I do feel that there could be um, some way of, say, I wanted to say vomiting. They go vomiting it out onto pages um, in some way. Yes, is the answer. Excellent. Well, I will look forward to reading it because I believe that. I, it must have crossed your mind. Yes, I also, yes, it has crossed my mind. I have a friend who, who also um, does a book foundry for people who want to do nonfiction books. So, oh. um, so which is great. But also I'm looking with one of my clients as well, who's an artist to doing some Oracle cards to help people find that place in their heart physically that they can go to when they need that guidance. Yeah. The heart's such a, um, a funny. Uh, and, and gut, like we've got all of this. Mm -hmm body that we leave because we seem to think that our brains know it all and our brains do not know it all our, our, our bodies are not slaves to our brains they you know we are one and our bodies are talking all the time and pain is the only way it can tell us something and if we actually say okay what's hurting why why is that hurting they will tell us if we tune in absolutely that's such a good point. You mentioned the oracle cards, and I think that's a brilliant idea. I think they're so popular as well. It, it did feel a bit like, gosh, there's many, many out there at the minute. But um, it's such an easy way of letting people connect. And there's ones that are not particularly connected to spirit. This will be connected to spirit. Um, that, that, that kind of are just like, oh, this would help you today. And, you know, there's like, there's ones for everyone. And yeah. I just, I just think there is... My friend is an amazing artist, and I just think we can do it in a way that will help people just get in touch yeah. to know, well, yes, what it's okay if something feels wrong. Ask what it is. Yes, that's it. Well, exactly. That's the thing. That's the other problem, fear. Again, yes. if we can get rid of the fear and say, look, we will be okay. Um, yeah. We'll see. Watch this space. Absolutely. So now we're winding down to the end. Uh, I want to talk about your retreats and how people, if they do want to come along and have a bit of healing, because there's so much on offer, what can they do and what's coming up next? So the retreat is always open um, Monday to Wednesday. Actually, Monday to, yeah, Monday to Wednesday, 
um, for one or two nights. You can come um, have two hours every day, stay over. I do a breakfast, a light breakfast and a soup lunch, both freshly made on that day. So, and then dinner, you are entitled to go wherever you like into the sites of Warwick. Stratford's down the road, so you can go to the theatre. Make it a lovely occasion. If you don't want to, you can just hide in the beautiful cabin. And we've got TV and there's books and I've got loads of nourishing books all around. You can just snuggle up um, and enjoy being here. Um, that is what the retreat has to offer. But I do treatments outside of that. Um, and I do courses. I'm doing a Reiki One course from the cabin. Um, February, March 11th and 12th and February Reiki 2 11th and 12th and then there'll be a quantum healing day which is just one day um, beginning of April um, all those people just really wanting to come for self love you don't need you're not going to come away with a certificate you're just going to be just how tips all these tips that we've talked about how to get to you how to get to nourish you and how to find out more about ourselves and be our own best friends and uh, listeners, I'm going to put all the links in the description, in the show notes as well. And also, I would encourage you to look into uh, all of what Nikki offers as well. So see what you're drawn to. It may be that you're drawn to reflexology, or maybe you feel as though you need some other type of healing. See what you're drawn to. But also, you would do a consultation, wouldn't you? You offer that on your site. Do a consultation, and obviously, I do readings and healings. And um, yeah, there's reflexology, there's Dawn Method as well. If you actually have physically a bad back, it's amazing. Um, it's like a German method of actual just uh, movement rather than manipulation. So it's brilliant. Um, also, you can't see this because it's the wrong way around. I also make a balm because oh, yeah. I am allergic to everything. And um, I make, started making it for myself. And then everyone went, this is really nice. Make it. So it is. Um, you could eat it. There's nothing oh. in it that would hurt you. Ace balm. What is it it's for? Ace beauty balm. That is obviously the wrong way around because we're on camera. Um and you can buy it on my on my site. It's all there, which is nikkiwakeman.co.uk. Shah will sort all of that out. And um, so I did that just, again, not taking toxins into our body. Just mm -hmm. another way of not, because we're sold all this stuff that is taking into our body all the time. And where does it go? It goes to our liver to process. And that affects our hormones because that's where our hormones are made. And it just slows down our whole process so we get more and more stressed and more and more full of stuff we don't need to be full of. So this is just um, basically essential fatty, essential fatty acids that you need anyway to ingest, but you're putting them topically. And there's some, uh, there's one that's fragrance-free and there's one that's um, basically frankincense and rose, um, which are very good for anti-aging. Oh, lovely. Um, so that's also what I do. Excellent. So the link of that will be, but I can, I can kind of smell it from here. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> All natural as well. So that's going to be amazing. So the links will be there. Also, guys, I would encourage you to visit Warwick. So go to, it's just a beautiful town and it's not, it is busy. It can be very busy, but um, so the retreat, try and go to the retreat as well. Now, we are going to put a fork in it. I call it far out random question with a Q. I'm just going to ask a very random, it's very random as well. So it's got a little bowl here. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. So what was an experience you didn't think much about at the time, but ultimately made you a stronger person? Blimey, um, <laughs> that is a the what the thing that came the thing that came first was my parents. When I was little, I was the youngest in my family by quite a lot by eleven years, and my family at that point all went skiing a lot. They had friends in France, and we'd go skiing, and we would go skiing every year with people who were really wealthy and that had chalets out there, and would ski for four months a year. And we would go for one week in February half term when there's usually a blizzard. And I would, went from the age of six. And every year I'd twist a knee. 
I'd um, it would it would be horrible, um, and I I found a way of getting through the ski lifts when it's blizzarding by repeating poems to myself. I didn't know even who wrote Tiger Tiger Burning Bright in the in the whatevers of the night. I didn't even know, and I would repeat. Um, I can't remember who it is now. Who is it? It's a really famous. I don't really know. famous. Um, we'll insert it. I'll insert, we'll insert it. it. It's a really famous uh, poet. Um, and I would repeat it over and over and over again. And I learned a way to cope with cold and um, feeling fear. And because I knew it would always be, it would always be okay because the day, well, like one, the day would end um, and it would, and also the cold would end and um, it was only a moment. And going downhill was really great fun. So I learned that to put up with the, horrible bit you often got a really good outcome um and at the end of the day you'd be like so thrilled with yourself that you'd made it that it had been like really hard but really good and I felt really rewarded even though I was never any good at it um I mean I'm all right at it I can ski now <laughs> but um and but I could it was kind of overcoming a fear that I never told anyone about my parents never knew because obviously I'd be a spoiled cow if I moaned about going skiing or all that kind of stuff so it was a kind of interesting, um, looking back, I found my love of poetry and how to get over fear. That's powerful, though. It's a beautiful metaphor for life as well, as you were saying, that to go going through the tough stuff and going downhill is fun. So you climb up because it's hard, but then the road down is just smooth sailing beautifully put and lovely metaphor for life as well and a good way for <laughs> us to end our interview today Nikki it's been a pleasure and a joy for you to be here for me and it's just been lovely to speak to you learning all about what you offer and your healing abilities as well and yeah I have a course as well coming out um which will be be your own best friend um which is about quantum healing six weeks, some one-to-one -one work, some group work, and some just stuff to get through some homeworky stuff. Excellent. Um, when is that? It will be coming out March, April, after the Quantum Healing Day. I'm going to put it on the back of that so people can understand more if they've been and um, have a chance to process it all. Um, right. So if, if people wanted to come, really, they could do both. They could do the quantum first and then do that one. Yeah, but they sit they sit alone, but they have the choice to do in person and online if they choose. Um, yeah, it's available to both. And then I will run the courses and the quantum healing days in succession as well. So that will be a continuing um, cycle. So people can um, hop on, come. It will be a day if it's just the, the in person and it will be over six weeks um online brilliant again it's just getting your intuition getting back into yourself finding your own in intuition your own creativity um and really immersing yourself in that so you um you find your yes and no's what we were talking about with the kinesiology you know really being able to find your your inner guidance trusting yourself yes that brings up a quick question about online because a lot of people may ask well i can't get to work or i live in the states or i live in canada <laughs> Uh, are you offering Reiki online? Can you what what can you do online? Online, I can. I can do. I have done. Yes, absolutely. I can send Reiki online, no problem at all. I can also offer Reiki online to learn Reiki one, one and Reiki two, um, and masters. If you would, if you would like, you can still do it all online. It will all be on Zoom. Energy is going everywhere. It doesn't. The internet it does not stop that. It's amazing. So I've done a lot of Reiki one and Reiki two on as online courses for people in France mainly. It seems excellent. But, um, ooh la la. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, so yeah, it's there's no there's no limit. Um, and the quantum healing works in a way sometimes even better online because there's no physicality to get in the way because you just have to get on with it. It's it's a kind of, um, you cut right through. It's amazing that you can cut straight through to someone's energy 
you see their aura and their energy more sometimes online, um, obviously with a good connection and all that kind of the tech going well. Um, because with Reiki and healing, you can send it even if I can't see you, even if I never see you, I can still send it. It's crazy, but it's true. So it's it's always been available that way. Um, but to teach now, you can do it online. No problem. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our listeners on Apple are in France. So, guys, we are worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> Just go everywhere. Oh, worldwide. We can go anywhere. We are indeed. And the healing course is so brilliant. I'm glad you brought that in. So all the show, it will be all in the show notes. Thank you for the work that you do and that you're helping others, so many people. And continue, please. And I'll come up and see you. <laughs> I'd love to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. It has been an absolute joy. You're brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, your body, and your soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert practitioner, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations infused with highly suggestible hypnosis to rid yourself of anxiety, fear, stress, and negative thinking. These guided meditations can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your everyday life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy, 